Surprise, Digital World. Welcome back to another episode of Spliced In Later, an unexpected episode. I know that in my last couple of reviews, I said, that's it for a week, see you later. And here I am, literally less than 48 hours later. But it was pointed out to me that something was finishing up this week, which I knew but also didn't know, forgot. It's, I think I thought there'd be 10 episodes and it turned out there'd only be 9, oh, so I'm just a forgetful person. But it lines up with a continuing series of episodes that I'm doing, and I don't want to leave it too long because I definitely cannot do an episode next week, unfortunately. So it will be two weeks before I get back to you, and at that point, who cares? No one really cares anymore. It'll get buried away for all four of my listeners. They'll never be able to find the episode. So I thought, why not just do it this week? You got three episodes this week, plenty to go through, and then I'll be back when I get back. Because today we are talking about the just completed MCU TV show, What If, on Disney Plus, an animated TV show, MCU's first animated show. It lines up with our continuing look into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. As my frequent listeners will know, it is the topic that I talk about most frequently. Probably one of my most favorite things to talk about. MCU films have often dominated my top 10 lists for the years where the movies come out. What makes certain films great and some so-so. And I'm particularly in awe of the connected world that the Marvel Cinematic Universe has created starting with that little film iron man back in 2008 and then somehow successfully building such a wide world of movies which each go off in their own different directions have different themes stories movie types and yet are able to interact with each other in a way that isn't confusing or bloated so any person can pick up any bit of the mcu and appreciate it for what it is if they don't want to look into anything else they don't have to but if you do you get the benefit of that extra bit other stuff. It is, an, it is an achievement which has not been matched by anything else that has certainly tried it. So our ongoing series has mixed it up. Often I've gone back to the older movies and I'm attempting to work through them one by one to talk about the basically the early history of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the movies, what worked, starting that very early process of just attempting to bring together four heroes before eventually getting to what it is now. Mixed up with the fact that MCU is still releasing new stuff even to this day going on 12 years later so when a movie or a tv show finishes up its run i will do a review of that so we've had wandavision the falcon and the winter soldier and loki and in those examples i have waited until the show has completed its run before i talked about it because in some cases particularly things like the falcon and the winter soldier which has been described as just a really long movie there's not much point talking about it when there's only been a couple of episodes, they've only introduced a couple of characters, story points have only really got going, or in the case of WandaVision, the mystery is still very much in effect, so you don't really know what's going on or what the point is at that point. Plus, to wait until the end is a reflection on the show as a whole, its series. Did it work as a series of storytelling? How was the pacing? How was the character development? Did the ending story pay off what was set up in the beginning? Stuff like that. So we are now, of course, going to talk about What If, which concluded a nine-episode run on Disney+, Plus, started back in August, and its last episode was dropped yesterday. It is a unique one because, as I said, it is Marvel Cinematic Universe's first animated product. Everything else has been live action in some form or another. This is animation. This is animated characters, some voiced by their original celebrity voice actors, some voiced by just talented voice actors in general, taking over from the bigger names. For example, Robert Downey Jr., Chris Evans, Scarlett Johansson, James Spader, they do not voice their characters in here. But in some instances, Kurt Russell, Taika Waititi, Jeff Goldblum, who did play these characters in the movies, show up to give three or four lines of dialogue in a very fleeting appearance. So it's sporadic in terms of who came back for this thing and who didn't. I'm sure there's a reason behind the scenes for what worked and what didn't, but suffice it to say, it's it's a it's a it's certainly got more people involved from the movies than those that aren't. Now, to give you a brief idea of what what if is, because it is a unique concept, it takes a very popular comic book series from Marvel called What If, which is basically an anthology series, just taking on ideas that are not part of mainstream Marvel media, so taking important moments in Marvel history and giving it a what-if spin, 
going, what if, for example, Wolverine had joined the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants instead of the X-Men? What if Spider-Man had died and someone else had to take up the mantle? What if zombies were a thing that existed in the Marvel Universe? All sorts of stuff. I can't give you too many examples from the comic book series because I've not read it, but I know it's very, very famous, very popular because the what if scenario is intense. You can do anything that you want. And the great thing about the comic book run is that you never had to worry about finishing stories or taking into account continuity characters or things like that. You could do a four episode run where zombies persecute the Marvel world and then when you get as far as you want to on that, you can you can wrap it up. You can take all sorts of different things, tell as much of the story as you want, leave things either happy enough as it is or absolutely depressingly miserable and just go and tell another story. It's, it's creative license to do whatever you want. And now that the Marvel Cinematic Universe has built itself up into such a behemoth of continuity and established moments in lore, there are so many pivotal points from the history of the MCU that you could take and tweak just a tiny bit and explore how the outcome would result in a very different direction of a set of destiny for our favorite characters, Iron Man, Captain America, Black Panther, Star-Lord, all of them. There's so many characters now, so many storylines, so many junctures, you can do whatever you want. Bridging them all together is the character of the Watcher, I believe he's called Uatu in the comics, but I believe he may just be the Watcher on the show. He's voiced by Jeffrey Wright. He is this all-powerful god thing that exists outside of time and space who basically watches all these different stories and vows to never interfere regardless of how good or bad the situation he's watching is going on. He's essentially just a storyteller. He's telling the stories to us. He's the narrator. He's providing these concepts for us. What if originally when it was announced, I didn't care that much about it. I've never been huge in keeping up with all the animated products that come with all the live action things I want. For instance, I think Star Trek has got two animated shows, one that is has premiered called Lower Decks and the other called Prodigy, which takes some more Star Trek adventures and all that. I may watch it one day, but I don't really care that much. Same with Star Wars. I pick and choose what animation I want to watch. I remember I watched the Clone Wars and I didn't really care that much about Rebels. I did eventually get back into it, and then I, I followed on from there. But I know something called Visions has just dropped recently, and I haven't rushed to watch it yet. Word of mouth may convince me to check this stuff out, but it's not... I don't follow it with such a, a, a passion. And with something like the MCU, where I've been following with a passion everything that drops. If there's a WandaVision show, I'm going to watch it. If there's a Black Widow movie, I'm going to watch it. doesn't care what I think about it, I have to go check it out because I believe it's like your duty, my duty really, to keep track of this universe and try and try and see where the projections are going and all that. And also it brings me enjoyment. But with the what if scenario and originally the fact that because it's a what if scenario that all the stories they were going to tell didn't really have much of an impact on the MCU story as a whole because they'd be existing in what if scenarios. And at the time I thought that's got nothing to do with what's going on in the MCU anyway. Don't really care that much. I'll check it out later. But, and slight spoilers here for Loki, but Loki established that there is now a multiverse, essentially, through the results of what happened through that first season of Loki. The multiverse exists. So all these worlds that the Watcher is looking in on do now exist in their own separate realities in the MCU, but now have the potential to possibly bleed in to the live action stuff. We will have to wait and see how this goes with Spider-Man No Way Home that comes out in December, because that's going full into the multiverse as well. So it sounded like now, okay, the what if scenario is important to what's going on. Maybe I will check it out. Now, I can't really talk too much about what is in it because it's a unique show that one should go into not knowing what's coming. What I really liked about this show was I had no idea after each episode what the next episode would be like, What type of story they would tell, who would be involved, if the story would go on a happy projection or a sad projection. Would it take characters that we've seen many times over or will it take an obscure character that we've only met once or twice before? So I can't really talk too much about that, but I will give you a couple of basic examples of the earlier episodes just to give you an idea of what this show is actually tackling. So as the Watcher narrates these multiverse, he always takes one thing, one pivotal thing 
in the MCU and he says, what if this had happened differently? So for our first episode, what if instead of Steve Rogers getting the super soldier serum, Peggy Carter got it? What would life be like if Peggy Carter had been the super soldier? In our next episode, what if instead of Yondu going to kidnapped Peter Quill on the instruction from his father, he outsourced it to his Ravager crew who ballsed it up and kidnapped T'Challa from Wakanda instead. And then another example, what if basically zombies just overran the MCU? Who would survive? Who would die? And you have yourself a bit of a fun zombie adventure. That's about as much as I'll go into it. There's some other episodes which I could give you an idea of what they're basically about. But again, it's more fun just to tune into an episode and go, oh, okay, so we're here and we're following this. Oh, that's the thing that's changed. Let's go from there. Overall, I, I really enjoyed it more than I expected to. Again, I didn't have high expectations for it and I didn't originally care originally about it. I just thought, okay, it's a thing that's coming, whatever. But I found myself really looking forward to that concept of every week jumping into this, a random place within the Marvel Cinematic Universe and going on an adventure and seeing how things differed. And what I really, really liked about it was the anthology sense that once I watched an episode, that was that story. And you knew going into the next one that you'd get a brand new story. You didn't have to worry about, oh my God, what's going to happen there? I didn't really care because as I said, it's a multiverse. It's a different reality. I don't mind looking in on the universe, seeing it go absolutely balls up and then going to look into another universe because at the end of the day, it's still the multiverse. So it still doesn't really impact the current MCU timeline just yet. So it's just a fun peek behind the curtain of what could have been in other realities. The animation took a bit of getting used to in the beginning. What I will say, what I would recommend if the people who made What If ever listened to this episode, if you're doing something like What If with a multiverse, a variety of different worlds with different stories, this would be the time to, to get some, some famous animators or something like that with very different distinctive styles and ways of drawing and telling stories and get them to animate a different episode each. Every single one of these episodes has the same animation, all directed by Brian Andrews. Which means that as much as the, you get the variety of the different stories, it still feels like the same basic world. You have to remember, uh, it's a multiverse, so we're in a different bit. It's just a creative standpoint, but I just think if you had an animation style that was anime for one episode, and then you had another which was flat 2D animation in the style of Fairly Odd Parents or something like that. If you had a Jimmy Neutron style 3D animation thing, it would really heighten that that feel of a what if world and a multiverse world, but that's just nitpicking. Aside from the first episode, which I, again, I struggled with just getting used to it. Once from the second episode onwards, I knew what I was expecting and the animation started to work for me. I liked when the action was kicking off, when the, I mean, it's an MCU show. So you're gonna get the superheroes brawling and fighting with villains constantly. And when it is doing that, it does look pretty good with the explosions and obviously with animation characters can do things that you cannot physically do with live action human actors because it's just not possible. It was less good when people were standing around talking to each other because we go into our second point here, the voice acting. The voice acting is a mixed bag in here. Depending on who it is doing the voicing, it sounds wonderful and other times it sounds stiff and wooden, which goes into a very important point I want to make here. If you don't already know this, there is a very different distinction between being an actor and being a voice actor. Just because you are a good actor does not mean you can be a good voice actor. They are two entirely separate things. To be a good actor, you've got to have good presence, but you also use a lot of your body to tell the story and to tell your emotion. When I did drama class back in high school, they'd always tell you like, you've got to say the lines short, but your body is the thing that's telling the story. So you got to focus on that, which is great. That's what actors do. They emote through great line delivery, but also combining it with their, with their body delivery. A voice actor is completely different because they don't have the benefit of getting to act out their emotions and feelings. They have to put everything into their voice and they have to make their voice sound natural and believable that they're not just taking a piece of paper and just reading the lines out and then the lines get recorded and then put onto an animated figure. They have to heighten that up and make it sound natural and believable so when you're watching an animated thing like Toy Story or Shrek or anything like that, you don't get pulled out of the experience by going, someone is just reading a script to me. 
Voice actors work so hard to get this down pat, which is why some animation is some of the best you'll ever do simply through hearing the delivery of the voice actors. And that's why there are some famous voice actors that have been on multiple projects because they're good at changing their voices and changing their personalities to fit the lines and the delivery that they've got. In some cases, it's fine. It works well here. You've got, for ex I'll give some examples, Josh Brolin, Benedict Cumberbatch, Michael B. Jordan. They sink a lot of their voice acting into the animation, but they, they heighten the material so it sounds natural and it's great. Then you've got some talented voice actors who replace the the famous people who aren't involved, like Josh Keaton voices Steve Rogers, Mick Wingert voices Tony Stark, Hudson Tams voices Peter Parker, and they do a very good, if not perfect job, of mimicking the voice actors that they're doing. They're not 100% spot on, but again, they're talented, trained voice actors that work more for the delivery rather than the mimicry. But then you have uh, characters like well, actors, I should say, like Sebastian Stan as Bucky Barnes sounds asleep at the wheel and does sound like he is just reading the lines in front of him. Dominic Cooper as Peggy Carter times Howard Stark is completely over the top with it. So he sounds like a cartoon. I don't know if he intends to or not, but the Howard Stark that I remember isn't this, her, her, oh my God, her, her, her. yeah. There are a couple examples there, and it, it's sporadically through the episode. There is not a single episode in here that has 100% Grace voice acting. For an episode where you'll have Andy Serkis just absolutely killing it, bringing out the Ulysses claw, you'll have something like Emily Van Camp, which again is just, I am Sharon Carter, I was Sharon Carter, I am now being Sharon Carter here. So each episode is not 100%. But it does pull you out. For every great voice that sounds great, for the ones that don't, it's jarring and it reminds you that these aren't voice actors. They're not trained to be voice actors. And perhaps in certain situations, I don't mind hiring someone who can do the voice acting better at the, at the expense of authenticity. Then they'd have some weird, strange moments where you'd have great voice actors like Taika Waititi or Rachel House or Toby Jones who'd show up to go, <gasps> or... Oh no, and then that's it. I don't know how much it would cost to hire them to do that, but if you're going to the trouble of getting someone like Taika Waititi, who is memorable as Korg, to come back to play Korg, give Korg more lines than a gasp or a yeah bro. Like, just doesn't seem worth the expenses that it was probably paid to make that happen. Overall, I liked the anthology. As I said, I, am, I liked that each episode was a brand new story. I liked that it went in places that the MCU has not gone before in terms of tone. There were a few episodes in here, particularly one, which go in very dark, miserable directions. MCU has always been very famous for keeping things light and breezy. Even with the Infinity War endgame gap with Thanos snapping out half the universe, there was still levativity in the survivors and the jokes, and there was still the belief and the knowledge, really, that things would be fixed and everything would go back to normal eventually. Some of these episodes take such a dark downward crash in terms of disaster for our main characters and and when we leave them they're in utter despair or dying or all sorts of stuff like that and it leaves you with a hollow sense but it was a new sense and it lended to the to the sporadic of the episodes and the fact that you never really knew where things were going to go or what would happen which i really really liked and i really liked that the watcher was commenting on things as he went and his narration would change depending on how he felt about the story. If he's watching Thor having a big old time because he's a big party boy, he tends to look at it with amusement. If he sees a hero leaning into the dark side and destroys an entire universe because of it, he's generally annoyed. Sometimes he's miserable, sometimes he's cheeky. There's, there's a character to the Watcher which is absolutely 100% built in through Jeffrey Wright's performance. He made me really like the Watcher as a character and I want to see more of the Watcher even though all he really did was stand around and go let me tell you a story and then he did. Unfortunately where what it fell for me was that it did eventually abandon this anthology look. In the beginning when I didn't know and I thought each episode was just its own self-contained thing I was enjoying it. I know people were complaining that in some instances the episode would end on a cliffhanger and they'd go, I want to know what happens next. I thought, I don't really care. Maybe we can check in on this episode in a season two. 
We can go back to this universe. I don't care. But towards the end of the season, you do get the vibe and the sense that actually a lot of what's happening is starting to bleed into the other things. You know that the Watcher, even though he says the whole time, I swear I must never interfere. If you've ever seen a movie or a TV show, you know he's going to interfere at some point. But in terms of him getting interfer interfering with this, this, this consequence that's starting to affect the multiverse, eventually you start to realize, oh, okay, so everything we've seen is all building to a big final episode where everybody that you've seen across the different worlds gets involved. And while that's neat and fun enough, it takes away that uniqueness of the anthology sense of these self-contained what-if stories. If you're telling a what-if story and going, we've left it in a dark place, but don't worry, we'll be back in five episodes to fix it. It takes, a, it takes a lot of that impact away, which is unfortunate. I would really like them to embrace, especially moving forward after this, if they're going to be a season two, which I'm sure there will be, do bizarre what-if situations, take advantage of all the little stuff. A lot of the stuff they did this, week, this season was safe, very simple stuff which changed, was interesting, but wasn't hugely different. I mean, the first episode is basically just Captain America, the first Avenger, but if it were Peggy Carter instead of Steve Rogers. Go wild, go ape shit. The zombies one, great example. The whole zombies tearing up the world, how different superheroes would react to it, who would survive or who wouldn't, that's great. Have the, the episode doesn't finish with the zombie horde cured and everything back to normal. The zombies are still overrunning the planet when the episode ends. Do stuff like that. I want more episodes as well where people do bad things and turn to the dark side and as a result people die or people get separated or all stuff like that. I want that and then I want to never visit those places again. If someone does something which ends with them in their own personal hell, leave them to it. That's the be that's the beauty of a what if scenario. We don't need to fix it. We don't need to link everything. As a result because of that, the final episode, final episode for me for what if, while entertaining enough, felt flat because it felt more like a finale to all the other stories that we had before rather than its own self-contained story and it wasn't that particularly powerful. A side note as well, a character shows up in the final episode completely out of nowhere which doesn't fit with the vibe of oh we're bringing back all these characters so why is this character here? I later found out later on that that's due to COVID-19 because there should have been 10 episodes, instead there were 9, so that character's episode was cut, but they still included that character in the finale, which is very jarring in terms of what they're going for. It's not jarring enough to pull you out completely, but you do go, what? Who's this? Why are we here? What's that world? That story that they're coming from looks intriguing. I want to know more about that. No, okay, we're doing our standard fist up fight. Overall, what if though, is fun. It is a fun, unique thing that MCU has not done before, in terms of animation and anthology shows and the bizarreness of what they can do with the multiverse now that it is a new thing. I give it a 8 out of 10. It was a fun thing every week. I enjoyed looking forward to a what if episode, theorizing about what would happen into it, getting to experience the story, going oh cool, interesting, and then leaving that story and going on to the next one. That was a lot of fun. The animation grew on me. The voice acting, when it was good, it was really good. And when it wasn't, it really wasn't. And again, it all pivots down to just the just the fact that the MCU is going in these fun new directions. Because they've got to do at this point. They've got to shake it up and they've got to do things different. And this is a good example of them risking things and trying something new. It may not have worked perfectly 100%, but they dipped their toe in something. Now they've got to put their whole foot in and see what happens. So here's to more wacky batshit stuff in the MCU from this point on. There you are. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed my take on What If, the latest MCU installment, and this unexpected episode in general. I hope you've enjoyed this, plus my other reviews this week, No Time to Die, and Venom Let There Be Carnage. There's been a lot of good content for you, and I hope some of it at least has been entertaining. I will be back, not right away, but soon, so stick, well don't stick around, go and do something, but keep an eye out because eventually I will be back with a regular episode as per norm. Just not on my usual time because this boy needs to rest. But until then, I love and appreciate you all as always. Stay safe and kind to one another and I will see you all when I see you. You've been spliced in later. Adios muchachos. I'll catch you next time.